Thanks so much. Herbert, do you want to join us already at this early stage? He will One, help two. me out. Okay, works. Later. I will give a brief introduction of the project, short brief history of what we are doing in case anybody has not seen or heard of us before. So, we, we are the crazy people building an open hardware, free software, digital cinema camera. We've been doing that for quite some time now, and the beginning, the starting movement was started by filmmakers. By people who actually wanted to create films, they didn't want to build a camera, they didn't want to create an open hardware camera, they just wanted to make films. But, at the time the project was formed, that was actually quite a difficult challenge to master, because when you think back 10, 15 years, all cinema productions were shot on film. And that was a process that was very uh, kind of expensive, only accessible to an elite in Hollywood. And so you could only make a film if you got lots of funding and kind of making it uh, on your own. You had to start with video, but getting into the kind of region where the professionalism that we are used to kind of is home was really difficult. Then all the cinemas in the world basically summarized were digitized with digital projection. And then the next natural step was, of course, that you produced the movies also completely digital. And since there was no technology available at the time to do this, we are now facing the very strange and paradox situation that cameras 50 years ago were much more accessible and open than what we have now, even though the technology and the camera's performance, of course, greatly increased and everything. But what you have now are black boxes with lenses attached, basically. And that's exactly why we are here, why we are doing this, because all this black box protection and keeping everything secret and inaccessible is really not something an artist who wants to influence the image creation process or who wants to use the creativity to master and dominate images wants to use. And so uh, the project was formed an incredibly long time ago now that I see the year 2006, I'm already feeling like a really old guy. And it was formed in an online forum where people united because there was a camera from a United States company called Alpha. It was the very first open hardware camera in that sense, but it wasn't made for filmmaking. It was an, like a scientific application, general purpose camera. And the initial starting goal and motivation for the people in the community around what was not called Apertus at the time yet was to hack, well, you couldn't really say hack in that sense because it was already open, not reverse engineer, but adapt and hack and modify uh, this camera for filmmaking. And there was a guy in the, uh, Australia who built an open source, open hardware, stereo 3D rig at the time with two Alpha cameras. And there's this strange guy with the long hair in the middle who built software for the Alpha camera at the time. And uh, we always try to kind of pursue Alpha and convince Alpha that there's a large community of people who want to make films and this camera and this technology is very suitable for this. But we need some hardware adaptions. We need bigger sensors and we need live video feed and we don't want compression and so on. So we kind of try to convince Alpha that this is a field and this is a market that could really be something sustainable for them as well. But unfortunately, there were other players who were a little bit more convincing than we were, like Google, who uh, created their Google Street View car rigs, where they built thousands of uh, cars with cameras on top of the roofs of, of cars with alpha cameras. So that's when the company kind of shifted focus towards panoramic multi-camera array solutions. And that was for us the moment where we decided uh, we have to build it ourselves. If we don't build the camera that we want, we will forever be dependent on some other company that uh, would 
kind of comply with what we were thinking we would need. And uh, that's me at the Geneva Libre software meeting in 2012, if I remember correctly, announcing the Axiom for the very first time. It was supposed to look like this. We didn't know how to build it. We didn't have the people to build it. We didn't really know what we would require to build it, but we made a rendering. <laughs> And that rendering sparked a lot of interest and uh, gave us, I think, 10,000 unique websites hit in the first week that we announced it. People were going absolutely crazy. But we didn't really know how to build it. And we didn't have the funds for it, of course. We were running on donations. We had like two or three euros donated every month. That wasn't really going anywhere. The sensor, the image sensor alone is one, over 1,000 euros and we couldn't even afford a single one. Uh, say, build a camera around it. Then things changed a bit. We found Herbert, for example, so now suddenly... Yeah, that was about the time when, when they decided to build their own, as yes. Sebastian said, and uh, he, were looking for, he was looking for, for people to help him, and that's where I joined the project. Yes. And the funding problem, we also suddenly, not solved, but at least took the very first step. We acquired a pre Ars Electronica Award of Distinction with over, no, not over, exactly 5,000 euros prize money, which was an incredible amount of money for us at the time, of course. Now we know that you can't even pay an engineer for two months from that normal salary, but at least we could afford the image sensor and all the services we required to produce electronics at the time for the prototype. And we built, now historically uh, important only for the museums, basically. It's still working, it's still in use, but the, we only built a single unit of the Axiom Alpha prototype. A proof of concept where we kind of stripped in large diameter image sensor onto an FPGA development board, the Z board. And the only purpose was to kind of prove that we could build a camera like this, that the images coming out of the sensor were actually cinematic because the manufacturer of the sensor told us, guys, I don't know if this sensor will really be suitable for us. We've only been building machine vision sensors uh, so far. The sensor diameter is okay. You have a lot of pixels and the performance is good, but uh, we've never built a, a sensor for cinema applications. So this proof of concept prototype was built, um, was designed, built, and the software was completely written in about half a year. So we started almost three years ago, and um, around Christmas, two and a half years ago, we had the first still images at 4K, uh, which was a great moment for everyone. And about a month later, we had moving pictures from our Axiom Alpha prototype, um, which you, you can see here, one, one demo frame on, and the complete rig around the, as we call the shoebox camera, because you can see it here on the rig, it has a um, laser cut um, case and some larger larger diameter fan on the front so it looks really funny but it works fine and it still works today so we had proven that we can do it for ourselves and for for the community and the next step was to make it more distributable so that other folks could also work on this platform Yes, and so for us the natural next step was to go into crowdfunding, so to prove to the world that we built a camera, we collected all kinds of demo footage with the camera, we'll show afterwards a short clip of what we shot so far in the last couple of years. We attached the camera to a two kilometer long cable camera, we had workshops in different parts of all over Europe where people would use it and shoot so short movies with it. And then we ran crowdfunding, very successfully at the time. Uh, it started off with little success, so to say, and we weren't sure in the middle of the campaign if we would actually pull off to finish in the time, but with a very strong finish, we even managed to raise 200% of our goal of 100,000 euros and closed with over 200,000 euros. And the difference 
compared to other crowdfunding campaigns was that we didn't pre-sell a product at all. We told people, you can participate in development of the beta. Your money goes 100% to creating the technology of the beta. And in return, all you people who support doing, us doing so, you will get the camera, not for free, because we can't afford that, but at cost, which is basically the equivalent of for free in terms of hardware. And yeah, that was very successful. That was now one and a half years ago. The interesting part here is you have to realize at a part cost of about 2,300 euros or 2,500 US dollars, um, a contribution of 100,000 euros, which we originally planned with the campaign, um, amounts to roughly 500 or 400 uh, 500 backers. Uh, units and in turn this means if you multiply it by 2500 US dollars or 2300 euros it's quite quite the sum actually what uh, the campaign doesn't show. And now uh, two and a half years later the development of the hardware is mostly finished. We have a working camera as you can see outside with live footage and uh, demo footage. Uh, the software part, we are now kind of trying to distribute more by uh, building developer kits and sending them out to people who are interested in participating in this development. And in terms of hardware stack, I don't know if you want to quickly explain the different yeah. boards. Let's, let's go through it quickly if you do not know yet. Uh, the basic design, we originally started with a one-board design when we made the crowdfunding campaign, but we soon realized that we had to scale it up and make it more modular and uh, allow for, for different parts to be changed and adapted because we had so many ideas and suggestions and um, input um, that we didn't, uh, that it wouldn't have worked in the, in the one-board version. So we ended up doing four stack layers, basically. Uh, the fifth layer on the back is an existing development board, the Microset development board, which is also open source, soft and hardware, or hardware in this part, software is available. Um, and we added a power board directly on the, on the Microset board. The power board is, does all the power management and um, verification. You can um, sense the current drawn on the different rails. And in a future version, you will be able to adjust various uh, voltage rails to different demands uh, on, on the software basis. Currently, it's a fixed solution. Uh, the next board, the main board, so-called main board, has the same function as a main board in a, in a PC, basically it distributes the uh, different signals, it connects the FPGA from the FPGA uh, board to everything else in the system. It also features uh, two plug-in slots, uh, for this purpose we repurposed uh, PCIe slots because they are cheap and uh, because they are available, um, easily obtainable. And uh, also, they do not require to have a mating connector on the other side. So if you want to design your own plug-in board, you simply can uh, add the fingers for the PCIe port and plug it in and off you go. Uh, those are high-speed ports. Uh, each port, there are Two available each port uh, features about 12, uh, uh, about six gigabit uh, data throughput, so 12 gigabit in total, um, which is required for the vast amount of data you get from a 4K sensor if you want to record raw data. Um, the next part is our interface board, which basically uh, abstracts the, the sensor interface. Um, which also is the last board, the sensor board. Um, this only has the function to um, support the sensor, provide the, check the different voltages and provide the interfaces to the actual sensor. Um, we also added two shields. Those are similar to Arduino shields if in the concept, so they are low speed um, and you can add your own I.O. ports there. 
So this makes up the Axiom Beta development kit as we have it and you can see it outside if you want to. And the next step after the kind of developer kit phase is that we want to turn it into an actual product and this is one of many concepts how the enclosure could look like. It's a bit thicker than uh, small point and shoot cameras, maybe going in the direction of median format cameras. We'll see what different versions and variations uh, we will come up with in terms of enclosure. One very important aspect that uh, helped the crowdfunding to succeed so successfully in one uh, very important aspect now that we are starting with color science, raw recording, uh, post-processing the images and so on, is that Magic Lantern got on board and kind of endorsed us as if we were the Magic Lantern camera. They have a huge community, they have a lot of very talented developers and they are just known for kind of giving people access to the technology that uh, was uh, kind of kept secret from them so far. So this is a perfect match with our philosophy kind of as well. So basically one of the interesting citations from the Magic Lantern team is that they now finally had a hardware where they could just implement their solution, their software, instead of uh, reverse engineering the existing proprietary closed hardware that, as they usually do. In case you don't know what Magic Lantern does, they kind of cracked open the Canon DSLRs to make them suitable for filmmaking. Yeah, then uh, we applied for a grant from the European Union and to a big surprise we actually got the grant. <laughs> and teamed Horizon up with... Horizon 2020? Yes, it was a Horizon 2020 Information and Communications Technology grant for supporting and strengthening the growth of the creative industry. I think that was what the call was uh, worded in rough. And we teamed up for that with five different organizations all over Europe. There are software developers in Poland, hardware developers in Germany, uh, people doing mechanical design and manufacturing in Germany, uh, educational partner, which is the Angewandte, University of Applied Arts in Vienna, and the Apertus Association as non-profit in Austria as kind of the uh, entity who made it all happen in the past and is now also part of this project. Yeah, then uh, one thing that I just want to briefly explain because everyone's asking how do you actually operate the camera outside and the plan is not to use a PC uh, in all the future shots and shootings we plan to do, but to create a dedicated uh, remote control device. So if anybody's interested in kind of programming graphic user interfaces, microcontrollers, embedded technology or creating hardware for this kind of uh, device, you're very welcome to join us also in the other aspects of the project, of course. But maybe this is an interesting project to start with. So, of course, any serious engineer will use the SSH console to control the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and you have lots of these engineers on film sets all the time. <laughs> Yeah, another uh, kind of uh, small side project, or not side project, but sub project is uh, the uh, software called OpenZinne, which is intended to raw process and raw develop raw footage. So use the word raw in three times in a row in a sentence. And uh, lots of solutions are ready to do this for still images, like uh, raw therapy, dark table, UF raw, DC raw, so on. But there are none that do the same thing with moving images. So the goal of this software is kind of to take the raw development to the moving image world. And currently there is one German developer contributing and maintaining this, but there are lots of things and uh, open issues that need attention. So if somebody is more into software development, maybe that's an entry point into the project. Yeah, that's it from the official kind of side of the slides. These are the different uh, consortium partners. These are our names. This is the grant we received. And we are the Axiom. <laughs> Maybe uh, we want to go a little bit, if we still have time. I also want to show sample footage. I don't know if we should do that now or after the more 
finish of the talk. Maybe a little uh, pause now for the sample footage and then we are all refreshed for the discussion and the further topics that we want to cover. Maybe prepare the sample footage and we take some questions now, if there are some. Yeah, are there any questions from the audience? Can I pass? First of all, thank you for an awesome presentation of a very cool project. And my question here is, how did you form good relations with suppliers of different hardware? Um, obviously, the FPGA development boards and this has a reasonably good tradition of being open, but I imagine you know um, image sensors and this and that, various components. Generally, it's I come from a wireless background, and there's a whole other problem with NDAs and things like that than being open. Um, did you face any of these problems, or do you have any nice tricks how to go about it? Actually, the sensor choice was mostly because of the openness of the manufacturer who agreed to provide the data sheet and information about the sensor to everybody who acquires a sensor. Without uh, NDA. Without so NDA. And, um, so, um, this was one of the main uh, points for, for our project. It wouldn't be possible without that, because uh, it wouldn't make uh, sense to make a completely open hardware, open software camera, and then have some binary blob or uh, whatever, no documentation on the sensor registers, and so on. It wouldn't have worked. So we picked the sensor basically on, on uh, the avail availability of the documentation. Yeah, and tricks. I don't know if we applied any tricks. We just went to them and told them what we wanted to do. Maybe they thought we are crazy, but at least they kind of still provided essential support. And after the crowdfunding campaign, maybe they saw that it's still crazy, but at least a lot of people are ready to invest in this crazy idea. So, yeah, that's the trick we applied. <laughs> yeah. I guess, in general, in, to, to address the question, um, is, it's very important in open hardware design, as Catherine already mentioned, to be honest about your intentions and your ideas and concepts and where you want to go. It doesn't make uh, sense to, to get in touch with a company on the basis that you will produce a secret something and then oh, suddenly you make some open source, open hardware. And on the other side, it doesn't make sense the other way around. You cannot claim to do open hardware, open source software, and on, on base of that, get some uh, agreements or whatever, and then close it down. It just doesn't work this way. Yeah, so before we talk about a few challenges and things we are kind of facing now in terms of production and scaling production, let's actually watch some uh, cinema, so to say. I hope the audio is on and I hope the images work perfectly. Just a word of precaution. This sample footage was acquired with various versions of the software, with ver various versions of the hardware. So sometimes uh, certain things didn't work out yet, but we still wanted to kind of capture footage and record it. So there's actually some footage where you see errors and kind of lines in the sensor configuration, which we didn't do 100% perfectly. But we call it art in the feature, so it's uh, unique in that sense, kind of. <laughs>
So what you, we, we are now waiting for is the first uh, full feature movie uh, made with the Axiom camera. So <laughs> we hope we can present that one next year or so. Definitely. <laughs> So uh, some of the challenges that we are currently facing or the kind of stage of uh, production we're in right now. Uh, we're currently shipping developer kits, as you saw them outside maybe, uh, to a bunch of 20 to 30 developers worldwide. And the problem for us is that uh, manufacturing this electronics uh, with an industrial partner in automated designs for this kind of amount Make, would make the cameras incredibly expensive at this stage. So we would have two options basically, either pay that uh, much money and just provide the community with that uh, developer kits, or as we opted for the option, we do it ourselves. We assemble all the electronic boards manually currently, which takes a lot of time, and that way it takes a lot of time to actually ship the product or the developer kit in that sense. But we still think it's the kind of honest approach. It takes more time, it's kind of handcrafted, but it enables the community to grow without kind of blowing all the crowdfunding money just on producing 20 to 30 cameras. Uh, the question is now, because we kind of artificially made it more difficult for ourselves, we have to say, or because of some of the philosophical choices that we made, that we don't only kind of uh, commit ourselves fully to open hardware, free software, but we also commit ourselves to fairness in that sense, fair labor. We wouldn't go to China and just search for a cheap assembly place or have Foxconn assemble our cameras or something, that would be something we really wouldn't be feeling good about. So we kind of uh, limited ourselves to assembly places that charge a lot more money, which makes the cameras a bit more expensive, which kind of makes it more difficult for us to start production because now we would kind of need to produce 200 to 500 cameras in one go to make the prices kind of viable per unit. And the second kind of complication is that we want, don't want to produce a hardware outdated product. So we want to continuously innovate on top of the hardware and then produce new boards, new generations all the time. So our batch sizes are really small in that sense and will always stay small. And the question for us, or the challenge for us, is now how we can do this without making the camera unreasonably expensive, without kind of creating delays with production. We don't want to kind of wait for open slots at external assembly places because they always do big runs of uh, productions and they only can fit us in somewhere when they have a gap somewhere. And we kind of always be at the mercy of finding a slot somewhere for getting our hardware produced. So a lot of what we have been doing so far has been kind of doing it ourselves, DIY in that sense, keeping it in-house, but the challenge for us now is if we can maintain this for producing small amounts of cameras and larger amounts of cameras in the future. And that's something we don't really have an answer for yet. Also how we will finance this production because just building 500 cameras that each cost 2,500 euros material value. Yeah, there are some of the challenges. Maybe someone in the audience has some hints, tips, answers, lots of money, I don't know. <laughs> or just want to contribute in some way. Yeah, we are also interested in just feedback. How did other people do it? What are the kind of things, the ways that did work? There is, of course, the option to find an investor, kind of give away part of the project to someone else with all the implications of the independence we currently have. But yeah, that's the kind of uh, thinking and the challenges ahead that we are facing. So there are no worries for, for the folks who will receive the development kits, those will be covered from our do-it-yourself production, of course. Uh, but we have to find a solution for making a viable product at some point. Yes. So the, pro the general project is, of course, inspired and created by people who want to use the camera. But of course, we want to create a sustainable business, something that can uh, survive long term, that 
kind of creates an ecosystem around the camera, provides services, provides customizations, and new hardware, sells that hardware over time. That would be the dream come true, so to say, that one day we can actually kind of live from what we are doing here. <laughs> yeah. Are there any kind of comments, ideas, questions about these kind of topics from the audience? Yes. So how do you make sure that you can compete with the commercial competitors? Like the, they don't have the extra burden to make the inside tunable so they can go for whatever metric they choose and market on that. Do you have like an ambition to compete for certain metrics of existing products and that's the one point and the second how do you go for the future of technology like even higher resolution do you have plans for that? Um, two, good, good, two good questions. The first one, um, I often get um, asked how, how do you compete with existing proprietary products? And well, I think it's important to point out that we do not see proprietary cameras as competition. Um, first, because they lack an essential feature, their openness. So things you can do with a camera like the Axiom, you can never do with a proprietary camera. Um, and I think it is very important in the future to emphasize on this point, because we've already seen folks doing stuff with this camera uh, in the early stage, which would never have been possible on a proprietary product with big support from the company producing the product. And that's the key point, because if you have uh, like uh, 100,000 people who want the feature, uh, or you have 100,000 or more uh, US dollars to um, invest in a company who produces a proprietary product, uh, you have no chance to get your feature, your idea, your concept, your plans um, realized without um, doing it yourself. And if you do it yourself, yourself from scratch, you will spend a lot of time uh, till you get there. And that's the point where open hardware and open source software gets in. It makes it possible to realize your idea, to um, realize your project in a short time. So from the feature side um, competition, uh, we could compete on basically every aspect with commercial cameras, um, but I think the main point on cameras like the Axiom or the Elf is that you have the uh, simple way to change every aspect as you like it. For example, we have uh, folks who use the camera for a geographical survey. Uh, they have already modified the design to a degree that it doesn't even look like the Axiom Beta anymore, but it still uses the same design and the same internals, and they contribute back to us. Or other um, concepts, like we've shown several demos over the last um, months or years, um, like the Pong game, the Chroma Pong, if you maybe have seen it. So it's, it's a nice demo what you can do if you have access to all parts in a system. The second question was higher resolution, different sensors and so on. As the design is very modular and we only have basically one component which depends on the sensor, the sensor front end itself, it is easy to adapt this to a new sensor. And we will do this for several sensors over the next few months or years, depending on uh, the sensor. We already have plans on doing a larger, an even larger, more expensive sensor, also from CMOSIS. And we will definitely do a small format sensor, which is cheaper and gives basically some kind of entry-level Axiom solution. 
Does that answer the question? Yeah, so what you mentioned before, uh, of course, as Catherine said, most people don't care about open hardware, they just want to use a camera, basically. And I think there, especially in the movie interest industry, which is very proprietary and where open source in that sense mostly has bad associations, like what I've heard a lot of times already, ah, open source, that's the software that looks really ugly and never really works. <laughs> so there's still a lot of awareness to create, a lot of educating to do. And I think we've seen in the many years that we are doing this that it's rapidly changing that people are starting to appreciate open source accessibility and Magic Lantern is one of the prime examples that if a camera is open and modular and extendable that people really, really benefit from it. So, yeah, that's the kind of uniqueness we have to em put emphasis in in the future also in the way we market and in the way we sell our camera. Yeah, but it's uh, definitely correct. We need to emphasize on that, and it's it's something which will become a feature or a, a bonus in the future, where you can say, okay, interoperability is a big, big concern nowadays. Um, take it one step further. Can you modify it? Can you adapt it to whatever situation you want, you have? That will be a bonus. That will be a feature. So we hope. Yeah, next big issue is repairability because with all the proprietary uh, systems you have vendor lock-in, you have to send it to an office in the States if something's broken and have to pay whatever they kind of demand from you. But that's also something that's kind of difficult to sell because people, when they see a camera price, don't think about how long they will be using it, how will they repair it if it fails. That's also something we kind of edu have to educate people more and create awareness in the end, I think. Another goal of the Axiom in this context is that we want to build a camera which has not only a life span of one or two or maybe three years as typical proprietary cameras nowadays have. Uh, we want to have a product, a, a camera which will last for a decade or more um, and not in the same form. So the idea is not to have one and the same hardware to stick around for 10 years or more, but uh, the Axiom camera itself, so you will replace parts and basically after 10 years you will have a completely new camera uh, after you've replaced one and the other, the next part, but it will still be the same camera. So a platform and an ecosystem in that sense. Yeah, are there any other questions? Hi, just a quick comment, but um, it's interesting that one of the challenges seems to be the, the, to build a scalable model, I mean business model, in order to achieve uh, a time span. Uh, but at the same time from what you presented, I mean, the, 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 the strongest characteristic is the flexibility, the fact that it can adapt, change, it even uh, uh, change over a decade, which is unconceivable for a cons commercial product. But at the same time, it seems to be described uh, as a... Um, I mean, you, you mentioned quite a few different sectors that could be interested, yeah. that are already uh, um, quite a lot, I mean. So on one side, uh, w one thing I was wondering was, uh, did you... Uh, consider the, which are specifically your targets. I mean, of course, potentially it can be anybody, but at the same time, there's a, um, it, it, it's not so obvious how even to change a small board inside. So, obviously, you already restricted your target to people who can tinker a little bit. At the moment, yes. At the moment. Yes. Uh, what I mean is that uh, I see how um, it, it, it can be unique in terms of this flexibility and also even more advanced uh, uh, compared to commercial products because you can implement stuff more quickly, let's say, than them and make experiments that can be then distributed. Uh, but at the same time, maybe uh, uh, narrowing, narrowing down a little bit some kind of focus groups uh, more specific, uh, so not thinking about uh, from Hollywood uh, uh, um, directors uh, to uh, Fab Lab uh, uh, people, 
maybe would uh, contribute to, to have a more, a sh uh, maybe you have already considered that, but to have a sharper focus on which could be the target groups in order to have a straight development? Uh, I mean, having a constant feedback from them and then making a more kind of targeted product. I mean, it seems like for me like a kind of magic wand that can do wonders, but at the same time, uh, it cannot be for anybody, everybody at the same time. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just no, wrong. no, I fully agree. No, it, it's, uh, com you're completely right. Um, the problem we have here, or the challenge we have here, is um, despite the fact that the camera was created to make cinema movies, so this, this was the basic intention, and thus the, the target audience was basically movie makers who want to make their own movies, starting from uh, low budget productions up to high-end productions. But um, since we started with this idea, we already got so many different uses for the camera, not from us, from our side, but from uh, potential customers, from unexpected uh, target groups, <laughs> so to say. We got uh, keen interest from astronomers, for example, who are very interested because they can do processing inside the camera and thus do not need to store each and every picture they take. So they also have the chance to cool down the sensor um, because we have um, anticipated this uh, at an early stage and not for the astronomers but uh, for our own purpose to reduce noise effects and, and so on. So this is just one example where, where it goes. Um, this, of course, the, the, the price tag basically is prohibitive to, to see this um, tinker toy for uh, a few hundred bucks or so, what you can afford, because that's just not going to work even if we scale down and, and use cheap sensors and whatnot. It will be about uh, 300 to 400 uh, euro, and it's still expensive for just testing something. Um, so the, the target audience is a little bit hard to, to pinpoint in this case because we know the target audience has to value the product. We know the target audience has to uh, need the features or appreciate the features we provide, uh, but we cannot tie it to one, one single uh, um, kind of uh, activity or group. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, if there aren't any further questions, yes, there is one actually. Okay. Okay. Um, my interest is in uh, not in in movie making, but in photography. And I always wondered why nobody was making um, some kind of a small um, thing that you could uh, put into analog cameras and upgrade them to be digital. So a digital backend. Yes, and there are companies doing that, yes. basically. So w um, at the one side for uh, uh, old analog uh, 35 millimeter cameras, and the other question would be um, for medium format cameras. Uh, does this uh, company that makes the chips also makes uh, six times seven uh, chips, so you could uh, um, make a do-it-yourself uh, back uh, for like a phase one affordable phase one back? Yeah. So. Uh the sensor company who is building the chip we are using, uh, I think the biggest sensor is full frame, so no medium format. Uh, the price gets exponentially higher the larger the diameter, so even though if they would kind of create that kind of sensor diameter, it would be 10,000 euros and more. So that would kind of dampen the market or the interest in it, because I guess the other digital bags are in the same kind of price point. And the other question about creating just a digital bag. Uh, there is actually a guy in the US who is kind of implying 
a small sensor to create a scanning digital bag for medium format which doesn't work for moving scenes but he's kind of scanning landscapes by moving the image sensor along the act two axis kind of collecting the pixels along the two axis for creating a medium format image and that's a very affordable way for some scenarios to create kind of digital medium format super resolution digital images yeah for, for actual still images you can can uh, quite simply scale that up to to a few billion pixels if you if you do it correctly because you basically have the base resolution of the sensor and you can use all the information from moving the sensor around to create an arbitrary large canvas yes and uh why aren't we doing kind of photography camera? It's the very simple answer that our sensor alone, when you buy only the component, is already as expensive as a medium range DSLR. So we can't really offer something that those products can't currently. So we cannot compete on the price basis. On That's the, price the real point. point yes. Because we, of course we can also do still images in high quality, yes. um, depending on the sensor resolution. And um, yeah, it's no problem if you want to spend the money, then you can also use the Axiom Beta still camera. All right, thank you very much to both of you. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Herbert, for presenting this project. Thank you. Thank you.